Hanghor, Yevor Po, Yevok Winsor Po, Amen. Christos Hariad Imerevot. Christ is risen from the dead. To you and to us, what great news. This morning we gather once again to celebrate the climax of our liturgical year. Right at the beginning of the Joshua service this morning, the choir boldly proclaimed the Easter greeting. Christos Hariyari Berelot, Mach Bant is Mach Gofiat, Yev Harutiak in Euro, Mez is Yanis Barkeviat, Namapar Havidianis Amen. Christ rose from among the dead ones. He trampled down death by his death, and by his resurrection, he granted us new life. To him be glory forever. Amen. In these few words, we hear the central message at the heart of the gospel. We hear the good news that spread throughout the world in the years following Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. We hear the news that transformed the disciples from doubting, grumbling, complaining followers into world-changing apostles, willing to accept gruesome death in order to spread this news to every corner of the earth. In this Easter proclamation, we hear three very bold claims. The first is that although Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, he was raised from the dead. The second claim is that by his death, he defeated the power of death, not just for himself, but for all of humanity. And that although we may die by dying in Christ, we too will be risen at Christ's glorious second coming. In celebrating Easter, we tend to focus on the first of these two parts of the Easter proclamation. That Christ rose from the dead, and that death has been conquered by his death. And in so doing, we tend to overlook the third claim that is made in our Easter proclamation that by his resurrection, he has bestowed a new kind of life upon us. This life is not simply the life that we will experience in the kingdom to come, but it is a transformed kind of life that we can all begin living, starting from our baptisms. The early church had a very good sense of the significance of this part of the Easter proclamation. For this reason, for the first few centuries of Christianity, all baptisms that were done, except for in rare exceptions of emergencies, were done in the context of the Easter Vigil Vadara that we celebrated last evening. Those seeking baptism would have spent great length learning about the fundamentals of Christianity, studying extensively the Old Testament and the New Testament epistles. However, they were not allowed to read from the Gospels. They would not hear the proclamation of the Gospel until their baptism that evening. The gospel passage that we read last evening, proclaiming the resurrection of Christ, would have been the very first words that they had ever heard from any of the four gospels. The early church saw both the Easter proclamation and the grace that would be bestowed through their baptisms as inseparable, since they both aim at the goal of our lives as Christians. For all of us, in this life, we begin living in a new kind of life, established by Christ through his resurrection. The Armenian word for Easter explains the connection between Christ's resurrection and our baptisms even further. In Armenian, we call Easter Zavi, which is the Armenian translation of the word Passover. 
This is because the entirety of the story of the Jewish Passover, starting from the beginning of the book of Exodus, all the way through when the Israelites finally end up in the Promised Land, foreshadowed the events of Christ's life. Just as during the old Passover, the firstborn lambs were slaughtered and their blood was smeared on the wood of the doorposts to save the Israelites from the angel of death, likewise, during the new Passover, Easter Sunday, the firstborn Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was slaughtered and his blood was smeared on the wood of the cross in order to conquer death and raise us to new life. And just as on the old Passover, the Israelites were led by Moses through the waters of the Red Sea toward the hope of the promised land, likewise, on the new Passover, Easter Sunday, we are led by Christ through the waters of our baptisms toward the promised land of the kingdom of heaven. So Easter Sunday is not just about celebrating Christ's resurrection. It's not just about celebrating the far-off kingdom of heaven, far in the future. But it's about celebrating the new life made present to us today by Christ's resurrection, the seeds of which were born within each one of us at our baptisms. This third claim that baptized Christians have a new kind of life, born within each of them at their baptisms, may be the hardest of the three claims of the Easter proclamation to accept. I think that it can be so hard to accept because for the most part, we don't see any noticeable changes being manifested in the Christians around us, or even within ourselves. For the most part, most of the Christians around us may seem to live no more kindly, generously, or virtuously than non-Christians. If we truly have Christ living within each one of us, why are not more of us christ -like? Well, one of our Easter traditions may help us to understand this. Every Easter, we crack Easter eggs, proclaiming, Christos Ariani Meredos, Christ is risen from the dead. And on one level, the egg represents the tomb of Christ being broken open. And I think many of us have heard this explanation. And while this explanation certainly gives a lot of meaning to this fun Easter tradition, we can also see this egg cracking from a different point of view, as representing us in our new lives in Christ. As human beings, we all start off like little chickens growing in eggs. We all do what we can to grow into the best chickens that we possibly can all on our own, but after a certain point, our own efforts fail us. When we grow to a certain point, we come up against a barrier. We come up against a shell that constrains us from growing anymore through our own efforts. The shells in our lives are all the pain, the suffering, the sin, and the injustice in this world that prevents us from living out our lives to the fullest as children of God. And by our own efforts, we will never be able to break through these barriers. We need a force from outside of the egg to crack the shell in order for us to be able to break through and continue our growth toward being the kind, generous, and virtuous people that we were created to be. Christ, through his death and his resurrection, has broken the bind of the shells of our lives and all of the hold that they have on us. Pieces of these shells may still be there, and we can't deny this. There are cer certainly, as Christians, a lot of pain and suffering, and maybe even more so. But even though the shells are still there, they've been broken up. We have a way to break through them. Even though we, by our own efforts, 
are utterly incapable of breaking through the bondage of pain and suffering and sin and injustice and death in this life by allowing Christ to act upon us we can finally begin to grow into the people that we are created to be our other failure in living a life in Christ is not because this way of life is impossible I've heard many bad sermons that basically tell us that we're utterly doomed to live in sin forever. That is not the Christian gospel. Our failure comes because we try to do the heavy lifting on our own. Most of us keep trying to break out of the shell instead of letting Christ crack it from the outside. Most of us want to be Christian instead of wanting Christ to live in us. I tend to want to be a good person by my own efforts, instead of taking myself, my will, and my ego out of the equation. The true Christian is the person who does not care about himself being a good Christian. If your goal is just being a good Christian, you're never going to be a good Christian. The good Christian rather has forgotten his own self-image and pride to such a degree where Christ can truly begin to work within them, transforming them to be able to direct their focus fully toward serving the needs of others. Someone who is able to do this would certainly be a very different kind of person than the rest of us. In a sense, they will be part of a new humanity. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis describes what this new humanity looks like. And I see Elisa laughing in the back because she knows that this is probably my favorite C.S. Lewis quote. And I have, I believe, even in this parish, quoted it before. We'll see how many of you remember it. So C.S. Lewis describes what this new man might look like. And he says this, Already the new men are dotted here and there all over the earth. Some, as I have admitted, are still hardly recognizable. But others can be recognized. Every now and then, one meets them. They are, as I say, recognizable. But you must know what to look for. They will not be very much like the concept of religious people which you have formed in your head. They do not draw attention upon themselves. You tend to think that you're being kind to them, when in reality, they're being kind to you. They love you more than other people do, but they need you less. They will usually seem to have a lot of time to listen to you, to be with you, and to care for you. You will wonder where it comes from. And when you recognize one of them, you will recognize the next one much more easily. In this description, C.S. Lewis shows us that living in this new humanity is more than just being a good person. Certainly without Christ, many of us can do a pretty good job behaving as good people. But the Christian life when truly lived out, goes far beyond just being a good person. By dying to ourselves, to our own wants, our fears, our insecurities, and by allowing Christ instead to live within us, we will truly become new, transformed people, finally free of the chains of this world, and able to begin living truly as human beings were created. This may seem like a tall order, but it's not impossible. This doesn't happen overnight. It's a process which we begin in this life and which will continue in the world to come. As rare as these people are, I do truly believe that I have met a handful of these people already in my life. Whenever I interact with these people, they exude the presence of Christ, and they offer his warmth, joy, and love with all around them. I could, I suppose, just conclude that these people are unusual, 
They are flukes of nature and continue with my life as it is. Or I can make the choice to look at these people as examples of the type of life that I can lead by fully allowing my baptism to work within me, by truly allowing the new life bestowed on me through Jesus Christ's resurrection to be realized here and now. And so this is the new life that we come here to celebrate today. It's not simply a historical event, not simply a hope for the future, but we celebrate the person of Jesus Christ who can begin to act within each one of us here and now, transforming us together as brothers and sisters to become his body, living in his new creation. Indeed, Christ did rise from among the dead, and he trampled down death by his death. And in celebrating his resurrection, let us all allow Christ to come and to crack the shells of our eggs, and to allow his new life to dwell within us. And to him be glory forever. Amen.